Thank you and welcome at this late hour. I have made some bold promises when making the announcement of this lecture uh, about providing some insights or lessons what you need to think about when even launching a, a project when 10, 12, 15 people, 100 people meet up together and commit to a year or more of work. That is not just development, that there is more to it. And I'll try to get my point across. Uh, our company, now is it working? Yes. So, uh, our company has been around for a while, over 20 years. So we have seen many things changed over the years in the industry. But ultimately, it's all about the same, about your passion, obsession, and turning it into a product, but actually something that you believe in, you love. Uh, I'm going to come back to a speech I had at GDS six years ago at a different venue when I was in a very different situation and the industry was in a very different situation. I don't know if it's visible, but back then my speech was a post-mortem for Yield Truck Simulator 2. I talked about how we spent the last two years blogging, working on social space in the media, just to make sure that we built the initial fan base for our game to get across back then Steam Greenlight. Steam Greenlight used to be a thing it was the dream of many developers to pass it, but that era is long gone. Back then we were at 300 blog posts over the past two years, so a lot of time, a lot of effort was involved in not just development, but the other things around us. This is actually my point that I want to get across. So we got, in 2012, in the fall, we got out of Steam Greenlight, but it took a, fa a while before Valve actually released the game to Steam. Back then, it wasn't just a click of a button. You had to do with people stuff. So it re released in January of the following year, and somehow we absolutely had no expectation for that. We hit number one on Steam because of all the, probably all the advanced pre-warmed player base out there that was waiting for the game. We did something right with the marketing back then with that moment. And we, we hit number one for a day, for two, for three. In the end, we ended number one in a weekly chart. And back then, it was totally, absolutely stunning for us. 20,000 copies of the game sold during the first week. So that was enough back then, in a, I guess, slow period of January, to reach number one. And that was a very important moment for us, for prestige uh, kind of perception of, of the product, that suddenly the press, the reviewers, they had to take into account that this is a game that hit number one. The people voted with their money. It wasn't just uh, illusion. It wasn't just what we were claiming. It was players actually supporting something. That, so that it gave us very positive reviews ever since. I, I guess some kind of bias to reviews or to perception of the genre, which until then was really somewhat um, hidden from view or ignored. It wasn't considered a game even. Then. 500 blog posts later, we still keep working hard on that, and 6 million copies of the game sold in those six years. Our latest DLC for the game has sold, just past week, 20,000 copies in one hour to make it almost to the top of the chart, but we couldn't beat Artifact. It was too strong, but we made it at least to number two with this number. So the times are changing, the sales, as of six years ago, today wouldn't be that great. And at the bottom of the, of the slide, I also have uh, our user in, uh, visitor engagement on our blog to illustrate that all, all those years we keep blogging, we have 8,000, no, we have 83 million page views of the blog since we started. So we keep going, we keep in, uh, interacting with the community, keep engaging them through many channels. Block is just one of them. We have millions of likes on Facebook, we have Instagram, we have Twitter. We work hard and spend a lot of attention to keep people entertained, to give them, give them a reason to consider the game to be more than just the game, to be part of community, a family. 
So this is the illustration that I want to start with for what you need to consider and what you need to be aware of when th launching yourself, committing yourself to a project. So what's the point of view of, of the lessons that I want to get across? We are, what's the target audience even? We, there's a wide spectrum in the industry, we call it an industry, but I guess guys like 2K play a very different game than us in the middle, us independent, even bigger independent developers. And then there's these garage developers, as they're called, the small teams, the student teams, the fresh teams, that again work along a little different ambition or, or trajectory. So this is mostly concerned, my, what I want to speak about, is mostly concerned about really becoming a pro team that's 10, 15, 20 people. That's Actually, the number of people is not as important as the ambition. It's about finding your place, let's say, in Steam 100 or, or being successful in this sense, becoming a project that can earn the money back and become sustainable in the future. So uh, I'm mostly going to take a look at this from our perspective, just going through this story, becoming a company with over 100 people and becoming a kind of green, evergreen, having an evergreen project that can sustain us. So it's really relevant for mostly PC-oriented teams, but PC in Eastern Europe is at home. We are as at least the older generation didn't grow up with consoles at homes, so PC is very strong here. And it may also, the lessons may also apply on a limited amount to freemium or mobile space, which is way more crowded and way more difficult than we can even ima imagine in the PC space yet. Uh, my path here, SCS is not just trucks, but it's mostly trucks now for the past decade or more. We have been around for 20 years, so we have seen a lot. The industry today is absolutely different than it was 10 years, and again, difficult, very different than it was 20 years ago. That's not so much a history that gives you today a practical kind of application, but really seeing these changes and kind of anticipating the future has always been my, my task at the company. So I, I read a lot about industry, Read a, lot of, read a lot of industry press, watch sales numbers of various games, always every day check what's happening on Steam with this or that project because Steam is our most important channel. So I think I've trained my neural net somehow to, to try to claim some things that I've observed. Uh, so again, big indie perspective on happening, on becoming big indie, hopefully, or that's what most people would like to be stable and established. Ten years ago, I would say that building a game was, maybe 15 years ago, was the hardest part. You had to have really specialized knowledge to program a project from scratch. Tools were still limited and primitive compared to what we are used to seeing today. So the focus some years ago was the game itself. Uh, we didn't have digital stores, we had to go to a publishing partner who knew how to access customer through the shelf on retail store. So that was also, especially for Eastern Europe, super hard. How do you talk to companies in the US, in Japan, to even get their attention or travel there to, to pitch your game? That was a very different world without digital app stores. On the other hand, from a developer point of view at least, if you already establish such a relation, then the discovery of the game, the way that people get to know about your game, was actually somebody else's uh, responsibility. You didn't have to worry about that much. You just gave them your CD, uh, just burned, or even sent it online, and they, they were the guys. The publisher, the distributor was, was responsible for the, the other laws, for, for getting your game visible in front of people. So in the old days, and some people are still used to this, most developers were in a B2B, business-to-business -business situation. You had to talk to, you had to pitch your game to the agents, the publishers, the distributors. Maybe you had one global publisher if you were really lucky, or you had multiple smaller partners scattered around the world. Some regions would fail, some regions, some people would cheat on you, 
it was a different world, but you were, as a business guy, you, had, you were dealing with other business people. These days, it's like upside down. Distribution seems to be and is quite easy. There is app stores on all the platforms except for the uh, bigger, biggest consoles, but even there the world is opening. So it seems that the distribution barrier is gone, and in fact it's so, so disappearing that it gives us other types of problems. I would claim that building a game, not necessarily designing a very successful game, but building a game in principle is sort of like medium difficulty. We have tools, we have Unity, Unreal, we have our own engine, but it's also already established. So it used to be super difficult to write these assembler loops in assembly to pick, output a pixel on the screen. Now all that is done through layers of middleware and fantastic tools are, are available. So you can prototype a game in a matter of hours, days, weeks. What used to take years is now much simpler to do. And this leads to the third point, the game discovery now becoming super hard. So many people can do, uh, can create a working, functional, good-looking game, just getting some assets somewhere or building a project on top of some uh, uh, demonstration application that is halfway there. So the, the market is becoming super crowded. There is a lot of noise on it, if you put it that way, even though it's not so nice to talk about competing games this way, but actually if there is so many games out there, you can call it a noise and you have to have your signal high up above the noise. So all the independents, unlike, unless they are super, happy, super lucky to land a deal with Sony, like the guys from Beat Saber, Beat Saber all the independents are now becoming their own uh, publishers in the sense that they don't, they don't just bear the burden of financing the development. They now have to make sure that they are visible, that either do it themselves internally or they find a partner a publisher with this, sh the shifting role of the publisher is more about marketing and visibility than it used to be about distribution necessarily. But it's about you facing the customer, you facing the millions of people out there, you having to attract somehow the eyes of the millions of people out there. And it's, it's been out there for a few years, maybe it's kind of obvious to everybody here, but it's, I would like to point out how difficult it can be or how, how much of your brain power has to be dedicated to this and whether it pays off or not to ignore this or you just think that maybe there's this saying, build it and they will come, whether it applies to you, they are so lucky and so good at uh, designing a great concept without putting the other half of the work into promoting yourself. So that's what I would like to get into. I'm just wanted, I don't have much, much pictures and this is like very simple art, I'm not a great artist. So in the old days again, we had this kind of dilemma and we had to find ourselves in the middle of it. You can afford only s to make only some games when it comes to scope or scale or um, ambition. You cannot do GTI in a few people. So you, it was affecting your choice, your limitations of what you can do. Then there is, of course, what do you like, what do you love, and usually it's great to work, it's, it's much preferred to work on something that's close to your heart. And then there is something that people actually want to play too, and in large enough numbers. So you had this intersection where you have to think about all these aspects, because you're committing to something that will take a long time for you, of your life, to, you don't want to lose the time. Now, again, we are in a situation where you have to think hard, and this is the upper right corner. How can I afford, or how can I even believe that I can promote, that I can pitch my, my project, not just to a publishing partner necessarily, but actually what sets me apart, what, what I know about actually accessing the millions of people out there, either through Steam or any other platform. And this is really critical. It's, it's, making the intersection in the middle of these sets yet smaller and it just shows that uh, I'm trying to make the graphics pieces about the same. In my view, it's really a crucial part. Right from the start, you have to know what you are doing because just making a clone of some other game with a little bit of better graphics 
or now in pixels versus cool shaders. It's, it's not just enough. You, you have to have it in you, in your project right from the start. Uh, there is this term that's been repeated in games press or um, among the indies called indie apocalypse, uh, suggesting that the indies are facing really unfriendly environment. That what used to work a couple of years ago, you just go to Steam or you just appear 10 years ago if you appeared on Google's or apps, Android's App Store or Apple's App Store. A really trivial applications that become, became, got high visibility became successful. These days are long gone, especially on mobile, but now it's also on, on the dominant PC platforms. The front page of Steam or any digital market is occupied by all these already successful games that are staying around forever. And finding a way there is really tough. Getting some traction, getting some visibility, automatically out of the platform, just because the platform will send people there to your own games page, suggest it as relevant, suggest it as played by your friends in your friend list. It's way less likely and far less automatic than it was three, four, six years ago when Greenlight was just about to be replaced with the current system where anybody can enter the platform pretty much. There are now 20, 26 over 26,000 games on Steam, and it's getting worse. In this year alone, over 8,000 games were released. And we are just two orders of magnitude below what's happening in mobile. So I can really imagine surviving myself in mobile space. Fortunately, I don't have to. But for those who dare, if you have over 1,000 new applications every day, charting to become visible is like totally a lottery, even if you have super good product, super good game, everything done right. Just finding that way to become discovered, again the term, is really tough. So I want to point out some things relevant for that. And I want to take the observations on particular titles, games, successful games, especially in the local uh, development scene. Because surprisingly, the Czech development scene, not surprising, and I'm, I'm happy for, to see it, I think we kind of, or I use the term, we punch above our weight. If you think about successful Czech games and you look at Steam chart, usually a few of them would be at any point in time in top 100, either top sold or most played games. Somehow, the history has shaped us here in the Central Europe into powerhouses compared to number of people in the country on the PC development side. It would be great to see more of this and whether it's necessarily not just PC, eventually everybody tries to branch out into other platforms. I think we can glean some lessons from what's happened here and how it happened. Uh, I claim here that uh, what's what these big projects, these successful games projects that you have seen around on Steam for a couple of years now, share in common, is their long-term focus on their particular niche. They kind of make the niche a hobby for the super hardcore nucleus of their fan base. And if you have this nucleus, you can just build on top of around these some tens of thousands perhaps people that really are keen to follow your game for years. And you have to work hard to, to keep them around. So what we have in common, and I can include us, us as CS Software into this set, is actively building the fan community, not just ahead of the launch of a game, but if you want to keep your game around, if you want to maximize your hard work invested into creation of the game, you have to go on so long as it makes sense and build and help the community build itself for as, as aggressively, as actively as possible. The way to do it, and that's my kind of analysis that I want to uh, get across through Steam in particular, is that uh, if you have people around playing the game, sticking around with it, they generate more visits, more views, whether it's Steam al algorithms themselves or the platform algorithms in general, there is strong preference for those who already succeeded to succeed yet more. So you need to exploit this relation or this knowledge. You, you need to, you want to, just need, but everybody would dream to be able to 
exploit this uh, kind of correlation or relation and keep your players engaged, keep them in the game. So uh, typically what you would see in the Czech successful games is having people play a lot of hours in the game, whether it's Arma, whether it's Factorio, whether it's our trucks, people would have a reason to come back to the game to play with a mod, to play multiplayer, to have more DLC that from time to time bring new fresh content on top of the original and bring people, curious people back into your ecosystem to check for more. So let's delve into details of more of this. This is data relevant for, for our game, for your Truck Simulator 2. And just, I will throw a lot of numbers and graphs of various games on you. It's not important. Any individual data point is not as important as the overall impression that I want to make. We have a lot of mods on Workshop. People create alternate vehicles, maps, worlds, sound effects, weather, skyboxes, combine it together and some people, and about a third of our, actually, of our players, play the game modded. They spend more time with the game that we could have given them because they discover new things that the community has given them. And this means more hours spent sitting inside the application and doing something. And this, I claim, will affect actually your sales numbers when it comes to other people discovering your game thanks to this. We have a long kind of endless gameplay loop that you can go on forever delivering cargoes. And we also, inside, we do th stuff inside the game, like the core game loop, but we do a lot of things outside of the game. So as I said, many, many news updates, blog posts, Facebook posts, we tweet constantly all the time, and we keep updating the game frequently just to make sure that people see, oh, there's something new, it's worth my time, I will check it out again. So anytime we update the game, we get a nice little uptick in the players, in the player numbers, and this translates into uptick in sales, actually. You, you can see the effect of doing something, engaging the, the player base to kind of snowball more new customers on top of the previous player base. And just as is the case with the future, with the other games I'm going to mention, we are lucky and fortunate to be a leader in a particular niche, particular small genre. And we have, again, in the social space, 100,000 subscribers on YouTube or many, many views of our videos. There's a lot of work. The point is there's a ton of work invested over the years into making sure people do not forget about us, into making sure, making sure the people we have already won over stay around and consider, it, consider themselves pampered and privileged by our attention, and also making sure that if you are that visible that other people can easier, easily discover you. We also have a platform that we call World of Trucks, which is kind of social space, kind of Facebook for our game, where people can upload screenshots, and in the future it should do even more. It should provide some kind of meta game on top of the game. But really, really made sure to give two and a half million people a reason to register with the other platform to give us their email so that we can reach them by a newsletter. And we still have, after so many years of churning through so many people, we still have about, about a million people active on this platform, logging into the game, doing something. So the game is used in a way that people do not spend 10, 12, 15 hours with it and then put it away. A lot of people, hundreds of thousands of people over time, millions of people uh, come back to the game every couple of days, every couple of weeks, just to check off what, what's new. So even this way, we can even uh, make a single player game relevant for people for a long period of time to make sure that the players are there. And this is the, the, the point that I wanted to make. You see this curve from 2013 when there were, I don't know, a thousand players at the peak, going all the way to 50K. So thanks to uh, very nice people who provide, compile these charts from player, player numbers, you can see how hard we worked through all the various campaigns and sales at the end of the year to keep the, the players growing for us, to have more and more of the hardcore community snowballing into a really good number. And this usually gives us a place 
within top 20, top 50 most played games on Steam, even though we, we don't have official multiplayer support. There is a nice element to it that the modding community can really help you a lot, just as we've heard from Beat Saber two hours ago that mods played an important role in making their game relevant for longer than with just the core content. The same we can claim for us. So we even got multiplayer somehow tack tackled on, tacked on top of our single player game by the community. But this, this point should illustrate that if you, if you go this high, this is actually another compilation from Game Top Seller's website showing position of a particular title within top 100 positions on Steam. Thanks to uh, keeping the player base engaged and growing through all the years, uh, we can appear with our game in the Steam chart with the base game frequently flying in the top 100. The peaks, the, free, the regular kind of towers are the discount sales events that either done by Steam or organized ourselves through Steam. And they can show that if you discount the game, you grow a lot in, in sales volume. And that actually, if we had were to match it, that actually shows that you can, you can create a spike through a sale but after the spike, you have more players playing your game, which in turn benefits your future sales. So always thinking about how we can find more players, how can we can uh, grow the player base is crucial for our survival or for our, for our growth. I have a couple of, uh, I would hope to say, friends in the uh, uh, Czech game scene mentioned here uh, part in particular. I hope they won't mind. I also wanted to look at what other guys are doing. I, I always kind of check on them because I have to see what the trends are, what, what the other guys are doing. So I've compiled a lot of data for this speech, for this lecture, about what the other guys are doing. And it will be very similar in many cases to what I was claiming about our game. Uh, Factoria domino dominates and very nicely the factory builder genre that they kind of discovered or rediscovered. And they always update the game very frequently. They always polish and improve the experience for their existing players because they want to keep them around. They have a huge number of very deep informative updates on Steam. When you read these articles, and I do it from time to time, it's incredible how much they show you behind the scenes their thinking, their technical planning. Uh, they have a huge number of mods, even though they don't use Steam Workshop, they still have a way for their players to, to play the game in alternate gameplay rules. And also for them, importantly, and this is, again, had to be a lot of work and had to be a lot of thinking, they do stuff like their fantastic uh, launch trailer, which I think was embedded into so many hardcore PC reviews or articles that they g gave the initial got the initial push of visibility. So a lot of work outside of the game, that's my point, a lot of work working with your existing players because a future player will not be affected by your blog post or by your news update on Steam. But the current guys keep coming back, keep staying around and keep the players uh, high, player number high for the Steam algorithms to notice you, to see, oh, this is actually f played, probably we should suggest it. Uh, whenever we mention some discovery queue or whenever we, we compile uh, the suggested titles for other sim titles or builder titles. Factoria is incredibly stable and still growing, I, I think, a player base. They also have incredibly stable, except for the little holes that are happening, like kind of in inverse situation than our towers were there. Uh, incredibly stable sales. They are always in top 100, except that they don't do discounts. So they are always, all the year round, they are sticking to their price point and they, it works with their own wisdom and logic. So when there is a hole in the graph, this is probably when Steam had some kind of sale event for everybody, like probably Steam summer sale, then of course all the discounted games go up, but they easily return to the chart anytime and actually, you will not see 
any like drop in player numbers during that time. They're hardcore, those 10, 20,000 people that at the same moment in the evening, and I don't know how many it is across the day, but hundreds of thousands, I guess, are still coming back to the game and playing it all the time. This is not all new people coming new day. This is very likely to be these hobby people who come back to your game every couple of days, every couple of weeks, or maybe every, every day, and keep you relevant, keep, you, keep your title suggested to more people on the platform on, on Steam. I have a nice example, Arma, which is a leader in, uh, in the tactical shooter series, kind of tactical shooter genre. Uh, of course, they have spent over a decade building relevant games. This is Arma 3, so they have been building their fan base for, for longer than anybody perhaps in the country. But again, they have a huge number of mods, so they made sure that the game is mod friendly and that people have good experience with the mods. They have an incredible number of 480 updates on Steam uh, f of uh, their reports, showing behind the scenes things, planned things, reporting kind of honestly and objectively on, on the trouble that they, they face during development. They produce fantastic in-game trailers uh, to have people salivate, to want more. So again, an incredible amount of work outside of development just to make sure that they stay relevant for the people they already won, that they already got into their traps. And Arma, just like us, is doing also DLC. So even though uh, the, the curve is not ever growing, actually, their business must be growing because they sell and add additional content on top of the base game. And it shows how strong your game can, can how, you know, how long you can sustain your game uh, if you do it right, and if you have not just strong game, which is actually a must, but if you do the other, st the other things, if you think, if you devote the capacity, uh, the mind share to doing the news, YouTube, all this hard, hard work stuff, and they've been doing it for years, and it's inevitable. Uh, our mind charts is like ever present, always popping up into the top 100. So, uh, great for them. I also wanted to look at a particular event in space engineers' history, the recent history. Space engineers have been like the darling of Steam a couple of years ago, dominating the chart. And this was incredible combination of factors in their favor. They were, from early days, very much modable uh, product that people just put together, a makeshift starship and just mesh it together. Uh, so they had like 280,000 mods. That's totally incredible. That it shows a lot of engagement for, the, for their players to just fool around and do stupid stuff and have, have a good time with the game. And thanks to having this good time in the game, probably more people will be attracted. Whether it's actual word of mouth happening outside of any digital platform, any Steam native platform, or whether it's through the Steam algorithms, players generate more players or players generate more customers. They also update the game very frequently. They, blo uh, they put information, updates about the game frequently with videos, with actual professional like TV crew <laughs> making uh, uh, very good looking reports, status reports. So all this hard effort is happening next to or on top of the production itself. And I wanted to take a look at a particular uh, event in recent months because as I look at the data, as I analyze the data from day to day or week to week or month to month myself, and of course I have the benefit that I actually see the sales numbers at least of our game so I can kind of through this proxy I can approximate what's happening elsewhere. Uh, you can see that if you do something with your existing player base, it will affect your sales. Uh, you, Space Engineers, if I got it right, had a major multiplayer update uh, in the middle of this year. And on the, on the following curve, you could see what it did to their player numbers. The player numbers doubled, maybe even more than doubled during that time. Just because a game that was on the market for years has done something for their current crop of players to have 
better experience with the game, so they would come back, they were engaged, they gave the game a second chance. And this is uh, a region of the sales charts that actually Space Engineers is mostly flying just below top 100, but sometimes it peaks up, so you can, you can notice something happening organically. And this little corner down here is actually, and I believe it is, <laughs> I cannot claim it with 100% certainty, this is their organic sales now happening just in coincidence with bringing people back to the game. So they brought people back to the game and more people were suddenly lured, were fished out of the west space of Steam players to consider buying the game and they bought the game. And of course, I guess a major update then won them a feature on, front, on the front page of Steam because as it's not just with Steam, but I guess it would be the same with people from Apple. Uh, if you uh, are, have, are, lucky, are so lucky to be spotted by actual person, by actual uh, human in all these automated operations, then you can get some extra treatment, some extra visibility. And this would probably be the case that with the major update of the, of the game, they were featured on the front page of Steam and suddenly they popped all the way into top 10, top 20 with uh, a game that most of the time until then was just flying, just coasting, I don't know, 150 plays. So if you do something for your game, if it's still alive, if you still have a player base to, to engage, to, to uh, wake up from, from sleep, you can get not just organic sales on top of it, but you can also get platform attention and deserve a very important kick in, in sales through becoming featured again, even though you were only dreaming about it for the past year or so. I've also taken a look at Kingdom Come. I hope they, they don't mind. Pioneering non-fantasy RPG. And I also wanted to show just some random observations about the numbers, about the number of tweets they created through official channel, as well as over 10,000 various tweets that Dan Vavra has already now on his own Twitter, Twitter account. So many Kickstarter, Kickstarter news updates. I was one of the subscribers, so I got them all in my inbox. Thank you. Uh, so many great YouTube videos. There was so much professional work invested outside of game development into this area, just to make sure that you have, in their case, they were all timing it to the launch of the game, of course, not necessarily as I was covering the other games throughout the life cycle of all release game, but they did so many things so right on making sure they were visible. They were, I guess, even harassing <laughs> games media to make sure that they cover them. And it's, it's a must, it's inevitable to succeed, to do a lot of hard work outside of the game development itself. And of course, the darling of the Czech industry, they popped into the most played game maybe even until now through, the, through 2018 on Steam. And even though their curve got, you know, like they follow the classic AAA product kind of life cycle that they make a huge peak at the start and they just coast along, their, their sales are fantastic and anytime they, they get featured, people know about the game. The discovery has already been seeded with the people through so great campaign at the start of it, that uh, they can always become relevant anytime basically they, they fancy, because they did all that, all that hard work initially. So I have also have a few examples from international games that are darlings, these big independents that succeeded in the long term. Rust, again, huge number of updates, huge number of coverage, of their own work being uh, explained to people, huge number of mods, great cooperation with user-generated content creators. City Skylines, another fantastic example of a really dedicated and focused developer and, and publisher on this particular niche. Super friendly, so you see so many people playing it on streams or doing YouTube movies. Uh, Kerbal, again, uh, one of the success stories of the independence, so many mods, so many updates. Actually, a, a nice theme that I guess resonates with the parents or teachers. So, 
not just here, but in many, many circles in the independent uh, world, you see that success usually correlates very closely with people investing a huge amount of time, a huge amount of brain power, mental share into not just developing the game, not just locking yourself and coming with the greatest concept of all time, but actually doing the hard work next to it. So can we try to distill this into useful advice? And uh, maybe I've said it myself already, but uh, they work really super hard and long term, long ahead of the release of the projects usually, and all the way through the following months and years after their project was kind of completed, they didn't forget it, they didn't abandon it, they kept on supporting and promoting it and, and growing it. Just in our, our case, our sales have been growing each year for the past five years. This is absolutely atypical of, of traditional AAA game title, which is usually very hot in the initial week, then the, then the sales half and half through each following week, and then they, the next year they have to be replaced by the next sequel in the franchise. So my point that I wanted to make and that I want to still expand upon is that players generate players, players generate customers in, the, in, in eventuality, and that there is a correlation and even I would say ca causality between uh, your player base and, uh, and its growth and your sustainability or your growth in sales. So. Ultimately, I'm not going to claim that I can advise you on which genre, which topic of a game to create next. But if you are about to commit to something, there are some points that I would... Of course, you do it naturally, but I would like to, to re repeat or uh, cover in the following slides. And this is also typical for all the previous pages of the games that I've mentioned. If you pick something, ultimately, you have to totally believe in it, be passionate about it, because you are going to spend maybe just a year or two with it if you fail, but maybe you are going to spend a decade with it if you succeed. So you'd better make sure that you can, you know, uh, talk to it, talk about it with your friends, or boast about it even. And if, if your kids see it, you want to make sure that you are proud of what you've been doing. So it has to be close to your heart. I think it's kind of a prerequisite. It, it, I don't see many games in succeeding with, with, with indies that would be just called analytics, always result of just analysis of the market and we do this because market says so. It's usually that people have some kind of tie to the topic they have been doing, like you see Arma doing military, like Arma Bohemia doing military stuff for two decades, you see us sticking to trucks for 15 years, even though it was acquired taste, it wasn't initially any dream project of ours, we learned to love the trucks and we learned to understand the trucks, hopefully, I can claim. So whatever you do, make sure that you do not do it just because some investor said so or because you see a niche on the market and, and you actually hate the topic that would be very stupid for your long-term mental health. You can cheat, of course, because, as I said, you, have to want, you want to have a lot of players from the start and through the life cycle. You can try and, of course, adjust and adapt your dream topic to a genre with some kind of built-in audience. Like, in our case, we were really lucky to bump upon a huge pool of people who are actually in love with huge vehicles. That was, I guess, underserved niche that just got their game. But there are so many niches out there for people who, who have their hobby, who have their interest, and who can be addressed as topics where, where, the, where similar game mechanics may actually be portrayed through various optics of various themes. Uh, as I try to show the slides with the graphs, player numbers are key for snowballing more customers. So what, what are the limitations or what are the su suggestions for choosing the genre or the mechanics of the game. And I, I claim that player retention is super important. That's all the, what all these projects are doing, whether in-game or outside of the game. They don't want to 
lose a player they already landed, the, the customer that already has paid for their game can still generate more money for you, not from DLC necessarily, but from just staying around, telling his friends at school, uh, becoming a friend in some other, some other person's friend list who is playing the game so it pops up to the other person, becoming the little digit that will help the algorithm to make sure that your game is suggested in the discovery queue for another game. So player retention usually goes hand in hand with some specific genres that make it like inside the game. Builders, sims and simulators, endless survival games where you can run around the forest for a thousand hours. Uh, mod, mod, mod friendly games that uh, keep, give, give people a reason to come back to the game to try with a different skybox or a different um, armor or a different horse or different plane. So these are in-game things that uh, give people a reason to spend more time with the game just to discover another thing that the developer wasn't able to provide himself. It also helps to have a long game, like, like uh, Kingdom Come would be if you have a, a hundred hours of playtime in your game, probably people will spend a big chunk of it, most people will spend a big chunk of it sitting inside with the game running in their Steam client. So this gives you more players on average at any point in time and that generates sales. If you have a two hour long game, it may be a very nice artic, artistic uh, production, but your player numbers will go, so, will go down so quickly that you may not be able to sustain yourself in the, in the long term. So in addition to, to these things happening inside the game, of course, you need to engage people by any other means. I'm repeating myself and again and again, but it's the community building, the word of mouth, the social media, the influencers. If you think about Fortnite, how a simple game managed to land so many 8 million concurrent players, because the game is ready for the, all those people on, on streams, for all the content creators. It's built in into the game from day one, just to make sure that they have these outside of the game factors contributing to their discovery process. And of course, organic people who are engaged, people who already love your game, have some emotional kind of impact on them from the game, are much better than paying for random people by ads. So you always want to have, make sure that if you spend your marketing budget on something, do it on communication that's natural and that's organic rather than just buying some stock ads through Google AdWords or something. And with Steam, and this is like, you, you can game Steam kind of, if you have enough numbers of players and not everybody's that lucky, but you can kind of game the Steam's algorithm suggestions. Again, by pushing the player numbers up as much as you can, which is, it, it's, it's not automatic, it's not simple, but if you can find a way to engage your existing customers, do it, do an event, make sure you reach them by some kind of newsletter or something if you can, if you have them registered on a service of yours. Uh, more player playing, more people playing, more customers coming. So in this uh, constant battle for visibility, uh, you, you cannot just care about discover, having the person discover your game once. You have to remind them, you have to keep them entertained, and this feeds the monster of the algorithms on the platform to push your game up in visibility. So I somehow creatively try to name my, my lecture Stick to Your Guns, uh, meaning you should rely on your strongs, strong strengths and perhaps if you believe in yourself as a great developer, it's time for you to approach an agent or marketing specialist or publisher that can give you a many of things they can support on your behalf in uh, promotion, marketing, PR. I just wanted to make sure that uh, everybody realizes how much of our daily work now involves and now revolves around promotion, self-promotion, just to uh, make sure that your game stays relevant. If you spend a year or two or five making a game, uh, you want to make sure that you have a plan for five more years to, to prop it up to make sure that it's relevant and 
you shouldn't spend all your budget until the day of release, all your mental strength until the day of the release. You have to be ready for the following period. And that's very important. It's very critical for you not to be lost to, you know, abyss of time in a short time. You want to have sales that are long term. You want to have this long tail happening. And you, you are the only person, you are the only team, the author of the, of the game that can make sure it's happening. So my claim is that it's cheaper and safer to maintain a game that at least succeeded a little than to just throw it aboard um, and uh, start anew from scratch. And that's what you see with the, with the examples that I've very carefully chosen, whether it's Arma, whether it's us. We keep the genre relevant. We push hard to make it, make it uh, visible all year round. So successful indie games actually become sort of a service, whether the business model is freemium or not, or whether it's DLC or not you are trying to be evergreen for a long period of time. So be obsessed about promoting your game all through the dev cycle, early on, uh, as well as well after launch. Promotion has to be a natural part of your kind of team culture. Or it, it, ideally, your game's loop, just as, again, a Fortnite is showing that all these stupid dances and everything that people uh, share through social media, it's feeding the monster, it's giving them more people finding, discovering the game. And it's actually, with these digital platforms of today, it's your sole responsibility uh, to succeed. You cannot absolutely expect that Steam will somehow magically serve you eyeballs so that your game becomes visible. Only those who already are successful <laughs> can continue be being even more successful. And you need to make sure that you seed the initial success through your own effort. It will not happen automatically. And in a way, that's my final line here, you, can, you should be ready and hope for, but really it's, it's challenging on its own, ready for the situation when you may be, become a slave of your success, just as us are stuck with trucks for a decade or more, just as Bohemia will probably do some kind of military games forever. It's, it's great, it's, it's a blessing, but it's also a curse that if you succeed, you will stick around with the theme for, for some years to come. So again, make sure that when you pick your theme, your genre, it's something that makes you really like feeling good about being human or makes you proud and it kind of talks to your inner emotions or, or feelings, that it should be something you love. Otherwise, your passion, if it's elsewhere, would be struggling forever with this kind of conflict. And that's it. Thank you very much. I didn't follow time. I don't know. How. <laughs> what time is it? Oh, just about. So maybe there's not much room for, for questions and everybody's already hungry, but if you do have some questions, we can try. I have just a, qu I have a question regarding promotion and uh, basically professional marketing. How important you think that is in this uh, recent times because of all the noise that everybody should be making for their own products? But how much is going to matter that you get professional help with the marketing? Can actually individuals still do something? Well, I'm not a like professionally trained marketing specialist. I just see it from a like business perspective. But you see that everything now seems to be happening on social media. And when I see my kids, they will not go and look at a glossy magazine. With a, with a traditional marketing piece. Maybe it's even gone, maybe that's the era of paper magazines disappearing also. So the most impactful thing, I think, is if the team communicates their vision or their passion. Anything that's done by a third party team is actually not natural. It feels like dishonest, not necessary, but it feels artificial. So it's great if you if your development team is actually involved in all this, and it's not free, it's their time costs money, their time costs loss of focus or attention, but that's the strongest, most impactful way of communicating the strengths of your game or the passion of the team. 
So traditional marketing as it was, like buying ads on, on uh, Google or somewhere, it's still around, and to, I guess to a great extent it's around with freemium games on mobiles. I believe that great, huge games like Clash of Clans are spending up to a third of their revenue back on marketing, on bringing people back, and they do it by all means, big banners in outdoors, in browser, everywhere. For us, indies, I guess, this is lost money usually. We try to double with it. It's best if you, if you want, if you feed your community and have them work for you, kind of. We have a lot of supporters with the hardcore fan base, and they do the marketing on our behalf then. They produce the YouTube videos. So you have to just kind of feed it and work, make sure somehow that it spreads across the wider and wider piece of population through your community. Thank you very much again.